Buenas noches a todos. La verdad que como Sociedad Chilena de Ginecología y Obstetricia estamos muy felices de esta audiencia que tenemos en el día de hoy. Tenemos la oportunidad de conocer un tema muy relevante en lo que es el manejo del tamizaje del cáncer cervicuterino con herramientas más actuales. Y la verdad que es un placer para nosotros poder escuchar esto desde las palabras de quienes más han trabajado, quienes tienen más experiencia en esta temática. En el día de hoy nos acompaña el doctor Tomás Wright Jr. Él es doctor en medicina, estudió en la Universidad de Harvard, realizó su residencia como patólogo, el doctor es patólogo, en el hospital de, en Boston, Massachusetts, y es fellow de patología en la Universidad de Columbia, haciendo un fellow en ginecología y obstetricia. Durante 15 años fue director de la División de Patología Ginecológica en el Hospital de Columbia. Dirigió el servicio de colposcopía en el Hospital Presbiteriano de Nueva York por 15 años y fue presidente de la Asociación Americana de Colposcopía y Patología del Tracto Genital Inferior. Actualmente, como dice allí, es profesor emérito de Patología y Biología Celular en la Universidad de Columbia. El doctor está involucrado en múltiples estudios enfocados el diagnóstico y el tratamiento de la enfermedad del cuello uterino y es un activo patólogo en la práctica clínica de la patología ginecológica y la citopatología. Vale decir, tenemos a un profesor entre nosotros en una audiencia de muchos estudiantes. Cuando le comentamos esta situación al doctor, él estuvo particularmente contento en compartir con ustedes esta información. Así que una vez más, les decimos bienvenidos como Sociedad Chilena de Ginecología y Obstetricia. Aprovechamos esta maravillosa oportunidad de la presencia del doctor Wright en Chile y le damos las gracias al Laboratorio Roche por participarnos de la oportunidad de compartir al doctor Wright tan abiertamente con todos nosotros. Así que sin más, los dejo con él. Vamos a hacer una exposición de como 40 a 45 minutos y después va a estar abierto a todas las preguntas que queramos hacer. Doctor Wright, please. Can everybody hear? Is this loud enough that you all can hear? Yes. Great. And I will speak slowly because if I tried Spanish, it would be a disaster. <laughs> Thank you all for coming tonight. It's such a wonderful feeling to have so many residents show up at eight o'clock at night for a speaker in your non-native language. I think you did a very good job Is this going to be a board question? This is why we're doing this. I've been involved in cervical cancer screening for 28 years. And what I want to do during this lecture is to show you the transition which we have made over this 28-year period of time and to show you where the rest of the world is headed with cervical cancer screening. Because I think it's very likely in your lifetime, you will move away from using conventional cytology or liquid-based cytology for screening. It's something that is going to be relegated to the history books within the next decade or so. And I want to show you the data which will really support what I just said. So we've had an experience with cytology for almost a hundred years now. It's not quite a hundred years, but in another five years, it will be a hundred years since Dr. Papanikolaou first started looking at exfoliated cells from the cervix. An interesting point for you all as residents, because you may never have heard this, Dr. Papanikolaou's original subject that he did all of his work on was actually his poor wife. And he spent about five years taking cells from the cervix. They did not scrape them off with the spatula. They used a pipette to suck up the cervical secretions. And he did that on a weekly basis and carefully charted out changes during the menstrual cycle to the cells in the vagina 
and in the cervix. It was only later that they came up with the concept that you could diagnose endometrial cancer was what he was originally trying to diagnose. Subsequently, they figured out that you could do cervical cancer and cervical cancer precursors. What we know is we've been doing this for almost 100 years. In every single country where cytology has become established, we have seen a pretty dramatic reduction in invasive cervical cancer by about 70%. Now, there are a couple of things which are required to get a cervical cancer reduction. The first, which is really important, is that you need high quality cytology. And that sounds simple, but cytology for cervical cytology is one of the more difficult things that cytologists do because it's very subtle, the changes which result in a precancerous condition. And it's actually not an easy thing to do to get good quality cytology. The second thing you need is you need what we call a call recall system, where women actually are invited in to have screening done at periodic, at regular intervals. Not only do you have to invite the women in, but you have to keep track of who has abnormal results. And you have to recall those women so that they can get worked up and treated. It's not an easy or inexpensive program. But this is what we've seen in the United States. This is cervical cancer incidence from 1975 out through 2010. By 1975, we had a lot of screening already in the United States among whites. And you can see that we already had a pretty large reduction in the incidence of cervical cancer. In the 1950s, among whites, the incidence was around 35. So between 1950 and when this data starts, it had dropped in half. Subsequently, it's continued to go down to now it's only about 6.5 per 100,000 in whites. Notice, though, how the reduction has leveled off. We have actually entered the period where we don't think we can get a better reduction in cervical cancer using cytology alone in the United States. I like this graph because it shows you these are for blacks in America. In the United States in 1975, we had, not, we had bad health care for most blacks in America. They did not have access to health care, and especially cervical cancer screening. Look what happened as we developed national programs to get pap smears done in black women. A dramatic reduction. All of this is to just give you the background to what has happened and why I am not saying that cervical cytology is not effective or it's not good. What I'm saying is if we are going to do better now, we have reached the point where we're going to have to add new screening approaches. Limitations of cervical cytology are first, it is not as sensitive for SIN23 or NIC, as you would call it, as it once was thought to be. When I first started training, when I was your age, the people I trained under, they told me that the sensitivity of a single pap test was around 95%. These were famous people. Dr. Ralph Richard, who I trained with, 
He said, we occasionally miss a cervical cancer precursor, but it's really rare. Today, we have good studies, and we know that we miss between 25% and 50% of high-grade cervical cancer precursors using a single pap test. It also misses a, quite a few cervical cancers, although it's important to recognize we do not screen for cancer. Our screening is designed to detect pre-cancer, high-grade lesions, which we can treat and prevent cancer. It's very subjective. It has a low reproducibility rate. And it identifies women who have a lesion today. And if you think about it, what you really want to do is to identify a population at very low risk for developing cervical cancer in the future and bring those women out of screening as best you can or infrequent screening and also identify a group at very high risk that we can focus our energy on. Cytology doesn't do that. It only tells you who has a lesion today. Now, this is from a study which I was fortunate to be part of. And we're going to talk about this study a couple of times tonight. The study was the Athena trial. This was a very large study done of different screening methods in the United States. And in the Athena trial, we had four different cervical cytology laboratories. A, B, C, and D. And you can see there are a large number of women for all of the labs except for B. The first point is look at the age of the women in the different labs. It's about the same. Now, in this study, women were 21 to 90 years of age. So the average median age was about the same. Why is that important? Does anybody want to come up with an answer? Why age is important, that it's the same? Which age group has a high rate of abnormal pap tests? Young women. So the, if I saw a difference in age across the study. I could attribute differences simply due to the different populations. But we don't have that. Look at the rate of cytologic abnormalities. This is what we call ASCUS and above. In lab A, it was 3.8%. In lab D, it was 9.9%. Women of the same age, and it's more than twice different. Look next at the sensitivity of cytology for detecting a SIN2 or greater lesion. SIN2 or greater. 42% in the lab with the low abnormal rate 73% in the lab that has a greater abnormal rate. I'm involved in another study today of similar size. This was all done blinded, by the way, so the cytopathologist did not know the HPV status. This was all done with liquid-based cytology. So it's what we consider state-of-the-art in the United States almost a two-fold difference in sensitivity. Let's look for a comparison at the HPV test. Done in the same laboratories as the cytology, but notice there's no variability. Everybody is 88% to 90%. So if I go home now, and let you all finish your dinner. Do you need anything else to show you that we need to be moving away from cytology than this one slide? 
This really, it's the whole story. Cytology is variable. It has a low sensitivity, a molecular test, has the same performance. I don't care whether I do it in Santiago or I do it in New York City. It performs the same. So this is a list of a large number of studies. They've been done from 2002 up to the final data from Athena in 2014. These are all cross-sectional, so it's a single point in time. And we compare the sensitivity of a PAP test versus the sensitivity of an HPV test for identifying women with high-grade disease. Every single study, there is a significantly better detection rate using HPV than there is with the pap test. There's not a single large study which has ever shown cytology works better than HPV. That was a well-done study. So it's more sensitive. That's one point. The other point that I want to stress is shown in these bottom two studies. These are both large studies. Eichenberg, 19,000 women. Athena, 41,000 women. Both of these studies are registrational trials. They were done to get government approval for use of different screening tests. What that means is that they were done under very strict quality control conditions. Look at the sensitivity of cytology in Eichenberg, 66%. Sensitivity in Athena trial was 43%. And look at the HPV performance, 93% in this Eichenberg study, 75% in the Athena trial. So these are two well-run studies, one in Europe, Eichenberg, one in the United States, Athena, and yet they come up with very different estimates of sensitivity. You're going to see over the next 20 years of your career lots of studies which are going to be published and they are going to talk about differences in cervical cancer screening sensitivity. There is a fundamental difference between this study, which is the Athena study, and the Eichenberg study. And that is, is that Athena adjusted for something we call verification bias. Verification bias adjustment. What that is, is that if I screen every woman in this room using HPV and using a pap test, and if you are positive on either, I do colposcopy, I will get a very high sensitivity for my HPV because I am assuming that there's not a single person in the room who has high-grade cervical disease who would be negative on both her HPV and her pap test. When I use verification bias adjustment, I take a random sample of subjects who are negative on both of my screening tests. I do colposcopy on those subjects, and guess what? I find there are a couple of women with high-grade disease who are negative by both PAP and HPV. Since it is a random subset of all of the women who are negative on both PAP and HPV, when I 
back calculate that into the whole population, suddenly my screening test looked much less sensitive. This is a really the correct way to judge sensitivity, unless you're going to do four or five tests, which then if I did five different tests, which were totally different, I wouldn't have to adjust for verification. But that explains the difference. It is very difficult to do good screening studies for cervical cancer. So when you have companies come in and talk about small differences in the performance of their test, it probably is going to be more related to the design of the study than it is the actual HPV test, provided the HPV tests are done in a good study, a large study with good controls. So, I've shown you HPV versus cytology in these large trials. Well, the first way we started using HPV to screen was to co-test. And for co-testing, which I hear you do some in Chile, for co-testing, I bring a woman in and I screen her using both the HPV test and cytology. And what I'm really doing is using HPV to overcome the low sensitivity of cytology and the variability. So I want to show you the first good co-testing study. This was done by the Italian government. It was 33,000 women, 35 to 60 years old, and it had two arms. It had a conventional cytology arm where women were screened with PAP, and it had a liquid-based cytology arm where they also got an HPV test. Women in the cytology arm who were positive with ASCUS or greater got referred to colposcopy, and they found 51 cases of high-grade disease. In the experimental arm, women got colposcopy if they either had ASCUS or greater or if they were HPV positive. And they identified 75 cases of high-grade disease. So which arm do you want your patients in? The one that detects more disease. But it's not that simple because when you look at the number of women referred to colposcopy in the cytology arm, it was only 2.7% of screened women got colposcopy. Here, 10% of women got colposcopy. So we detect more disease, but we refer a lot more women to colposcopy if we send every HPV positive woman to colposcopy. And in fact, that is too many women. Even with all the waste in our healthcare system in the United States, no one is going to consider 10% of women getting screened having colposcopy. When you break down the two test results, in the women with high-grade disease in this study, what you find is that of HPV-positive, PAP-positive women, there were 52 with high-grade disease, and that was 69% of all the high-grade disease. <coughs> Look at the HPV-positive, PAP-negative women. There were 21 cases of high-grade disease, so 28% of the high-grade disease in this study was missed by the PAP by itself. But this is the line I want you to focus on. There were only two cases of high-grade disease found in women who were HPV negative with a positive cytology. Only 3% of all the cases fit into that group. So seeing this data, 
What do you think the next large randomized trial that the Italian government decided to fund was? Another co-testing trial? No. Primary HPV screening versus cytology. And I'll show you the next trial run by the National Cancer Institute in Italy. Coming back, though, to the fact that we've got a lot of women who are going to be HPV positive with negative cytology. These are the rates seen in different trials. This is Kaiser. Kaiser is a large health plan in the United States. They've got millions of women in Kaiser. And they have routinely been co-testing all women over the age of 30 since 2003 is when they first started co-testing. They find that 4.2% of women in Kaiser over the age of 30 will have a negative PAP and be HPV positive. And these are the other studies. All are much smaller than the Kaiser, but they're all about the same. About 5% of women over the age of 30 will have a negative cytology HPV positive when we do co-testing. So that's a group of women that we're worried about. And 5% is a lot of women to send for colposcopy. It's too many. Nobody, Because remember, you've got all the PAP-positive women also who need colposcopy. The second point is how common is high-grade disease in women who are HPV positive with a negative PAP. And these are women 30 years and older. And you can see that it ranges from 6.1% to 2.4%. This is from the Italian study. They did not do verification bias. Everybody didn't get worked up. The number which we use for guidelines is about 4 to 5% of women who are HPV positive, PAP negative, will have a high-grade lesion. And this is not SIN3, it is SIN2 or greater. Well, that's a pretty low number. That is lower than what we normally consider the threshold for colposcopy, at least in the United States. If we take a group of women with ASCUS, and I don't know their HPV status, you would find very similar results. And we don't like to take women with ASCUS to colposcopy who we don't know their HPV status because the rate of high-grade disease is so low. So what we have to do is to figure out a way, if we're going to co-test with both tests, to manage women with negative cytology who are HPV positive to determine which women need colposcopy and which women need rescreening at a year is typically what we're doing. And there are two approaches which we've been taking for this. One is to follow up these women who are negative cytology HPV positive, bring them back in a year. At a year, what we find is that half of these women will now be HPV negative. Even in older women, half of them clear their HPV in 12 months. The other approach, which is newer, which I think a lot of us are quite excited about, is genotyping, and I'll give you the data on genotyping. But we have to do a triage. Now, two slides back. If 5% of my population is negative PAP and HPV positive, 
at the end of a year, that number is going to be down to 2.5%. Half of them will have cleared their HPV. This number, since if you have a high-grade precursor, you will not clear your HPV, this number is going to double. So instead of having 5% high-grade disease in this population, at the end of the year, when I look at the women who are persistently HPV positive, I'm going to have 10% of the women as having high-grade disease. That is the same risk as a woman with ASCUS who is high-risk HPV positive. So these clearly will be the level that we want to send for a colposcopy. So this is a management algorithm. This is the US accepted algorithm, psychology negative, HPV positive, repeat the co-test at one year. If you've got an abnormal PAP or you're HPV positive, we send you to colposcopy. If both tests are negative, I rescreen you in three years. Accepted. What's the problem with this? Women, doctors, you get a cytology negative and you're HPV positive, and I tell you, don't worry about it. Come back in a year. We'll test you again, and if you're persistently HPV positive, we'll then work you up and do colposcopy. What are you worried about? What if you have a cervical cancer? If you have a SIN2 lesion, you're going to be fine when you come back at a year for repeat testing. But if you have an invasive cancer, we just waited 12 months to diagnose you. That's a problem. Because that was a problem, we found the adoption of co-testing was actually relatively slow in the United States because doctors were afraid of having their patients come back in a year with cancer and they were just concerned about it. So let's look at the HPV genotypes in patients with invasive cancer. This is from the group in Barcelona uh, Xavier Bosch's group did this. When he first told me about the study he was going to do, I told him he was crazy. He wanted to get 10,000 invasive cervical cancers and test them for HPV with PCR. I said, Xavier, can't we do this on 1,000? Why do we need 10,000? But he felt he needed 10,000 to very carefully look at all of the different genotypes. This slide shows you what percent of squamous cell cancers, these are invasive, have got 16 or 18. That's about 70%. And if we look at adenocarcinomas of the cervix, it's about 83%. So if I took all of my HPV positive women with negative cytology, and I tested them for 16 and 18, I would identify most of the cancers out of that population, and I wouldn't wait on them for a year because I would send them to immediate colposcopy. This makes co-testing much more acceptable to the standard OBGYN because they aren't worried about missing cancer. There will be some that are missed, but we'll pick those up at a year, and it'll be far fewer. The other advantage of looking at 16 and 18 is it doesn't just identify the women with invasive cancer. It identifies a subset of women who are at greatly increased risk for developing disease over the next decade. This is a Athena trial that I've spoken about already. 
42,000 women, 25 years and older. We tested them with liquid-based cytology, genotyping, HPV testing. Any woman who was HPV positive or who was PAP positive got sent to colposcopy, as did a random subset of women who were negative on both tests. When they did the colposcopy, the clinicians did not know why the woman was getting colposcopy. They didn't know the result of her PAP or her HPV or whether she was a double negative. We wanted to get all the bias out. The pathologists, we had three pathologists review all the biopsies blinded to all clinical information. So this really is a well-controlled blinded study. This shows you after three years of follow-up, the detection of biopsy confirmed either SYN2 plus or SYN3 plus in women who at baseline had HPV 16, HPV 18, the 12 other high-risk genotypes, or women who were HPV negative. And the first point is look at the great protection over three years if you're HPV negative. You just get very little disease. Second point is look at HPV 16. After three years of follow-up, all of these women had colposcopy at baseline and they had a second colposcopy at the end of three years, every woman in the study. 25% had biopsy confirmed SYN3 or invasive cancer if you had HPV 16. There's another large study from Denmark where they looked at younger women. These women were up through age 25, I'm sorry, 29, and they followed them for 12 years. If you had HPV 16 at baseline, you came back two years later and you still had HPV 16, after 12 years, 50% had biopsy confirmed <laughs> SYN3 or cancer. HPV 16 is a true oncogenic virus. It causes, in the majority of women who have it and have it persistently, high-grade lesions, which will go on to invasive cancer. That is one triage approach. There are other potential triage approaches which we're looking at today. One of them has to do with looking at P16. How many of you know about P16? You're not PATH residents. You're clearly OBGYN. P16, and I'm going to do this abbreviate because we're running out of time here, is a cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitor. It's involved in cell cycle control. Pathologists use it all the time. It's like a magic stain. It makes gynecologists just as good as their pathologists at reading cervical pathology. Here you can see a CIN2 lesion. I stain it for P16, and it lights up. I know this is disease. This is another lesion. I don't know if that's high-grade disease or not. I look at it at higher mag. It could be, maybe, but, you know, I'm 80% sure it's high-grade disease. Put P16 on it, the stains, you can make the diagnosis. High-grade disease. We'll skip the other examples. What we've started doing is using P16 on cytology. But because I don't have the architecture of the biopsy, I have to use two stains. And I use P16 and KI67. KI67 is a cell cycle regulatory protein. 
So it is expressed when cells are dividing. P16 is only expressed when cells are in cell cycle arrest. If I have a cell which expresses both P16 and Ki67, I know that I have a transforming HPV infection. And here is what you see on the stains. This is done on liquid-based cytology. You can do it on conventional, but it's a lot harder. You all can do this. You get rid of the cytopathologist. Here's a cell. It has P16 staining, shown in brown, and Ki67, shown in red. It's a dual-stained, transforming HPV infection. So how can we use this? Well, there are three ways. And I'm going to talk about these quickly. One is to determine which women with ASCUS and low cell need to be sent to colposcopy. Currently, we send all women with low cell to colposcopy because we know 85% of them are going to be high-risk HPV positive. So HPV testing doesn't help you. What if we use this dual staining on cytology? Well, there was a large European multi-center study, 27,000 women undergoing screening, and they did a PAP, they did Syntec Plus staining, HPV testing on all women, and they did Colpo if they were positive on any of the three tests. This compares sensitivity, specificity, and the referral rate in women with ASCUS who were either dual stain positive in blue or high risk HPV positive in green. So in the ASCUS population, if I do HPV testing, in this study they identified all of the high grade disease in the HPV positive women, and they referred 42% of the women to colposcopy. If I do dual staining, I detected 94% of the high grade disease, but I only referred 24% of the women to colposcopy. And if I'm going to follow these women up who are dual stain negative in a year, this seems like a reasonable triage. And they're using this now in Europe. France and Germany are starting to use a lot of dual stain cytology. That's ask us. Let's look at low cell. Sensitivity for HPV was 98%. Dual stain was 86%. 87% of the women with low cell, if I did HPV, get referred to colposcopy, only 53%. So it looks quite attractive. And it's beginning, it is not approved for use in the United States. We're designing the trial now. I'm part of the design team. But in Europe, it's CE marked, and they're actually starting to use it, mainly for ASCUS low cell. It's also possible that we could use dual staining to determine which women with HPV primary screening, if there are 12 other, we need to send to colposcopy if they're dual stain positive. And we've even looked at it for women who've got 16 and 18 and dual stain, send them to colpo. And I'm not going to show you any data. I just want to tell you one point. If you've got HPV 16 and you're dual stain positive, one out of two women have high grade disease. It's very predictive of who has high grade disease. And if you're dual stain negative and you've got 12 other, you've got very low risk of having high grade disease. So we're starting to look at dual staining there. Last two slides, because he's going to stand up and tell me I have to go. Where are we globally? Globally, 
we're really in an exciting period of time right now. Australia. Australia this year has adopted HPV primary screening in their national screening program. The algorithm is more complicated than what I showed you with the US, but they're still looking at genotyping, reflex cytology, if other high-risk types. They will begin at age 25 years. They will do it at a five-year interval, and they'll exit women from screening at 70. Netherlands, they're beginning this year. HPV primary screening, beginning 30, 35, 40, and then every 10 years if you've been HPV negative at 40. They are mainly using cytology to triage the HPV positive women. They have the option for genotyping, but the national program is they will triage with cytology. So globally, we are starting to see the update of HPV primary screening. And again, I think this data is so powerful, it's unlikely you will be screening with cytology alone within the next decade. Times have changed. Thank you all. Tiempo para algunas preguntas, así que aprovechemos la voluntad del doctor. Queda aquí el micrófono. ¿Quién quiere hacer la, alguna consulta al doctor Wright? Nosotros somos pediatras y vinimos a esta reunión porque nos interesa, porque somos pediatras especialistas en ginecología pediátrica. Y es un tema que nos interesa mucho porque hace ya tiempo, unos dos o tres años, estamos haciendo un estudio de genotipificación de virus papiloma en niñas, niños y adolescentes. Que no son... Eh, no son muestras de cuello, ¿ya? Es, es, en algunas pacientes hemos hecho muestras de cuello y tenemos de 56 casos estudiados, ahora tenemos muchos más, pero yo no los he vuelto a revisar, teníamos eh, un 25% más o menos de positividad en las lesiones que nosotros estábamos viendo, que algunas son verrugas y otras son lesiones tipo pápula, en la mucosa a veces de los genitales, que, que para nosotros son, no eran con, como el condiloma típico. Entonces, en esas niñas también nos salen positivo y de nuestra muestra tenemos como que el 60% tienen virus de alto riesgo, ¿ya? Y, eh, bueno, no las seguimos, pero hemos seguido a alguna paciente que tiene 16 o 18. Y a las pacientes que tienen 16 o 18 en la vulva, le tomamos muestra de HPV del cuello. Algunas pacientes, la mayoría, aclaran esto y nos siguen con el virus pero tenemos una paciente que es una paciente que fue trasplantada de médula a los 11 años de edad y esa niña eh, ahora es adulta, o sea, tiene 22 años, una cosa así, y ella llegó porque su pareja tenía condiloma y no, le hicimos HPV y tuvimos un HPV 16 y la controlamos posteriormente porque trabajamos con el Instituto de Salud Pública con un bioquímico y le, él le hizo una detección de la proteína E6 y E7 y la carga viral de ARN y, y ella además del 16 tenía el 35. El 35, las muestras que le fuimos haciendo cada seis meses, lo aclaró. Y el 16 sigue persistente. Entonces ahí yo me contacté con un ginecólogo o oncólogo que la viera. Y le hicieron una colposcopía y tiene una NIE 1. Pero a juicio del bioquímico con el que estamos trabajando, ya tiene muy mal pronóstico porque la carga viral nunca ha disminuido, por el contrario... Se, se nota más la, la manifestación de, la, de estas proteínas que son altamente malignas. Entonces, eh, no sé cuánto se puede esperar en esta niña, se va a esperar hasta que llegue a una niña más invasiva. She's clearly at high risk. And if she has persistent 16 and she's been a transplant patient, She really has to be followed because of the high risk. We find about 5% of condylomas will actually be HPV 16 rather than 6 or 11. I have a question that's about the genotyping and HPV testing. If I effectively do HPV testing and genotyping, what 
where do you take from the interval in which I have to do it if it, they're both negative? Is there a study or something? There are a number of studies which have looked at this. In the United States, the interval is going to be three years. Uh, the reason the interval is going to be three years is that the study that was used to get approval by the FDA was a three-year study. Uh, no country is looking, except for the United States, at three years. Most countries are looking at five years. And the Netherlands actually has what I think is the best approach, which is the same approach that the Swedish program is adopting, which is they're going to do five years for the first 15 years. And once in Sweden, you get out past three negative HPVs at five years, they aren't going to 10, which they did in the Netherlands, but they're going to go to seven. So I think everybody's talking at least five and up to 10. En aquellas pacientes que se hace testing primario y que son positivas para el 16 y el 18 y que la colposcopía no encontró ni E2 ni E3, ¿cuál es la forma que usted sugiere de controlar a esas pacientes en el futuro? It's controversial. Certainly, they need retesting at one year. If they still have 16 or 18, they need another colposcopy. The question becomes, now that we're starting to do a lot of long-term co-testing, we are seeing patients who have been HPV 16 positive for five and six years. There is controversy about what do you do with those patients. We don't have any data to derive. One group of clinicians, gyne onks, <coughs> gynecological oncologists, a number of them are suggesting that if the woman is in her 40s or older, you might want to consider a leap. That's reasonable. Uh, certainly, these women are coming in for repeated colposcopies. Um, but we don't know if the LEAP is going to clear their HPV-16. So if I do a LEAP and she comes back in a year and she's still 16 positive because she didn't have a lesion to remove, I will have done no good. The other factor that we don't know is what is the risk that a woman who's got HPV-16 persistently and has three negative colpos will develop a lesion going forward? And no one knows that. Um, we looked at this in the South Africa study that we did 10 years ago. And what we found was after three years of follow-up, we did keep detecting new leads keep detecting lesions in the 16 positive patients. But we don't really know the answer. ¿Hay algún rol del RNA viral en esas pacientes que son persistentes al 16 y que no tienen lesión en el minuto? That's a great question. There is a lot of, again, controversy about this. We would like to think that the messenger RNA could be predictive of risk. The problem is, is that the messenger RNA assays that have been developed, Aptima is the one which is clinically available, were all designed to work well with ASCUS management, co-testing. Therefore, their sensitivity is very similar to the sensitivity of a DNA assay. They had to make the sensitivity because of the way what they designed the assay for. So I don't think the current generation of assays will give you much benefit. Someone may develop a new messenger RNA assay with a different sensitivity, which might be useful. Bueno, si no hay más preguntas, le damos un aplauso al doctor Wright y le agradecemos su presencia.